Okay. Last week we started a uh, little mini series on Satan. And basically, we kind of looked at the fact that uh, although he's more powerful than us, needless to say, we tend to give him a lot more credit than, than he deserves in that sense. Uh, he is not God in the sense of being able to create anything or to sustain anything. He is referred to as the God of this world, but not in the sense that he created it or that he sustains it or that he keeps it going. It's just that the, the world system, basically, for all intents and purposes, um, it's, it's in his court. Sin is so rampant, unbelief is so rampant, and of course he is basically in charge of this type of stuff. But he is not omniscient, he doesn't know everything, he can't read your brain, he can't read your thoughts. He's not omnipresent, he can't be any, everywhere at the same time. And he is definitely not what the Bible refers to as omnipotent, which is all powerful. These are all attributes that are reserved for God and God himself, not Satan. So when we look at him as an enemy, he is powerful, much more than you and I individually. But there is a verse that says, he that is in you, which is God, the Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus Christ, he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world which is Satan. So at the end of the day, you're still a winner. We saw that he goes by various names. We know him by the name Satan. We know him by the name Devil, Lucifer, the Serpent, Beelzebub. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. So it's just not one little name that he's relegated to here. Very, very important that we understand when we're dealing with Satan, that the Bible is very, very clear about how he operates, the field in which he operates, the way he operates, because the Bible does not want us to be left defenseless and caught off guard. There's a verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. <clears throat> I've got a new Bible here today, and the pages are all stuck together yet, so bear with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Beginning in verse 11. Now, yeah, let's start a little bit sooner here. Verse 9, for to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you whether ye be obedient in all things. Now Paul is right, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church here, and of all the churches that Paul established, of all the churches that he was in communication with and that he wrote letters into, this was the church that gave him more trouble than any other church. The, the Corinthian church was just rampant, rife with problems. We're talking about sexual problems. We're talking about marital problems. We're talking, I mean, just fill in the blank. The Corinthian church was full of it. And so he was constantly writing to them and putting them down in that sense. <clears throat> Verse 10. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgive anything, to whom I forgive it, for your sakes forgive I it in the person of Christ. <clears throat> he says that if I'm going to forgive anything that you guys do, I'm going to do it in the person of Christ. Verse 11. Why? lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. 
And I'm talking about Satan and the way he works. We're not ignorant of his devices. We're not ignorant of his methods. And look at the context here. The context happens to be forgiveness. We are not ignorant of his devices. So in the context of this, he is saying that if I don't forgive the way I should, if I bear a grudge in my heart, I am giving in to Satan. He's taking an advantage of me. We're not ignorant of his devices. And one of the ways that he works <clears throat> is through the field of either forgiveness or unforgiveness. Every one of us have to some extent or another been hurt in our lifetimes. The means and the methods of that hurt may be different. The intensity, the complexity, the duration, the hardness of that hurt may vary from person to person, but it still hurts. And it is not easy for us, or it's not natural for us in the flesh to want to forgive people who have hurt us, and especially hurt us bad. But in not doing that, in not forgiving, in other words, taking ourselves out of the equation, David made it clear that all sin, regardless of how it's manifested, all sin is ultimately directed against God. When he messed around with Bathsheba, in that sequence of events, he, he committed murder, he lied and cheated, he committed adultery. All these things took place within the framework of that particular sin that he did, and a year or so later, I mean, he, he suffered with this for over a year before it finally came out. And Nathan the prophet came to him, pointed his finger in his face, and says, you have sinned against your God. And David says, you're right. And in his prayer in Psalm 51, he cries out, he says, against thee and thee only have I sinned, God. Well, I, in my world, what do you mean against God only? He had Uriah killed. He ruined Bathsheba's life in the, in the sense of, you know, bringing immorality into her life like that, committing, committing adultery. I mean, he hurt a lot of people. He lied to his high priest. He lied to, his, to Joab, his general. There was a whole bunch of repercussions in this particular sin. And yet at the end of the day, David conceptually understood that all sin, regardless, is directed directly against God. Against thee and thee only have I sinned, O God. <clears throat> so when we choose, and it is a choice, when we choose not to forgive somebody for what they have done, you've taken the high road, you've taken the moral road, you've taken the, the road that, hey, you've crossed a line and there's <clears throat> nothing you can do to get me back on your side again. Whatever the reason. At the end of the day, we're hurting ourselves. Jesus said, you've got to take yourself out of the equation. Forgive for my sake, if nothing else. So Paul says, if you've hurt me, I'm going to forgive you. And I'm going to forgive you because I don't want Satan to have an advantage over me. And if I harbor unforgiveness, I'm giving the devil ball game basically so we are not ignorant of his devices the bible is very very clear it lays it out from the third chapter on as to what this guy is about and how he works in genesis chapter 3 verse 1 it says now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the lord god had made now if god himself is going to put a descriptive on you. You can pretty well take it to the bank 
that that is a true reflection of what you really are. God didn't come out initially and say that Satan is a, a tough guy, that Satan is a smart guy, that Satan is a you know wonderful guy, you know, just had a wrong turn someplace. First word out of God's mouth in describing this guy is that he is subtle. We all understand what subtleness is. There's a million examples that we can just, you know, pick from life itself. But, but we understand the difference between overt and being subtle. You can put somebody down by getting in their face and, you know, give them a bloody nose or so, something. Or you can come at them subtly and put them down sometimes without them even being aware that you've put them down. Another word for subtleness is disguise. If Satan wants to take a young person and ruin them you know, with drugs, let's say, he's not going to come out with this impression, oh, oh uh, let's go down to Skid Row, let's find a dumpster in the back of an alley, and let's find so-and-so who's laying strung out there, needle marks up and down his arms, uh, hasn't had a bath in 16 weeks, hasn't had a decent meal in who knows how long. <clears throat> Every money that they can scrounge and steal and finagle, it goes right into their veins and so forth. Look at this guy, a wasted life, a totally wasted effort, a totally useless piece of human garbage just sitting there ready to get into the dumpster himself. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Wouldn't you like to be like that too someday? Well, if that's the approach he takes, every young person on the planet would just walk away and say, no. So what's he do? He comes at it subtly. He finds that young person at a party. Somebody that they might like or respect or think is cool, he watches them do something. Maybe it's just smoking a little pot. And they see, oh, they're all giggly and they're happy and they're having a wonderful time. And in his mind, he thinks, wow, maybe I'd like to have a good, wonderful time. And say so they might try it. And they don't have the ability to see five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road what the end result of that thing is going to be. That's called subtlety. Satan doesn't come at you full-blown and say, oh, try this and you get to look like that. No, try this because now you'll be happier. You'll be more fulfilled. You'll be part of the crowd. You'll be one of the in people. You'll be one of the popular people. Try it. You like it. Don't put it down unless you've tried it. <coughs> so he comes at us from a subtle aspect. I don't care what the sin is. It starts out with an incremental little step in the wrong direction. Mass murder doesn't start out by killing 500 people. Mass murder might start just with one person. And then they do another and another and another and another. Subtlety. Some people have that ability to be subtle. Other people are just like bulls in a china shop. All of us have met people who pride themselves in saying, you know, I just tell it like it is. I, I, I don't care if I'm going to hurt somebody. I don't care if their feelings are hurt. I'm just going to tell it like it is. I don't like people like that. I mean, if I'm ugly, I don't need to be told I'm ugly. If I'm fat, I don't need to be reminded that I'm fat. Not everybody's like that, but there are some people. I had an aunt like that. That was just one of these types of people. She didn't care who she offended. She didn't care what the repercussions of what she said were. She was going to get it off her chest as to what bugged her. And boy, did we go round and round.
So the primary earmark of Satan is subtlety. It's the primary earmark. Look over in James chapter 1. Do another example here. James chapter 1, beginning at verse 12. James 1, 12, it says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive a crown of life, the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. God will not come to you and dangle sin in front of your face. He will not come with a vial of heroin and say, hey, would you like to shoot this up? Because you're going to feel really, really good when you do. Those little endorphins in the front of the, the cerebral part of your brain up there that is the, the little pleasure nodes and so forth, they will actually explode. When you shoot this in your vein, it gets into your bloodstream and it hits that part of your brain. You're going to, you're going to have joy, the likes of which your brain cannot even imagine. Here, try it. God doesn't do that. God doesn't tempt us to steal. He doesn't tempt us to lie. He doesn't tempt us to do anything. God does not tempt us with evil. Now, he will try us. In other words, he will allow us to go through things, through circumstances, through events, like Job had to go through. He will try us to see how strong we are at any given moment. He will try us to see how long we can endure before we just fall apart as such. Like in the case of Abraham, when he was told to sacrifice his boy Isaac. God didn't have to go through that thing. God knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew the end from the beginning. But Abraham didn't, necessarily. And certainly Sarah didn't. And so God allows him to go through this thing. He puts him through it. He tries him to see how he's going to come out. Abraham does good. But understand the distinction between temptation and being tried. Verse 14, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Now, I don't care if it's, you know, you, you lust the neighbor because he's got a great looking boat or a nice SUV or a car or he's got a better house or he's got a better looking wife or husband or they got a better job. It doesn't make any difference. Just fill in the blank. It's the same thing. We are tempted when we get drawn into this thing that we wish we had something else. Verse 15, then, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. It always starts in the head, in the heart. And then the body finally follows through. So when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So there's a difference between temptation and trials. God will put you through a trial, but he will not tempt you with sin. So when you are tempted with sin, that's somebody else. That's not God. So don't confuse the two. Well, what else does, does Satan do here? Well, he's a liar. Number one, 
Understand that going out the gate. He is a liar. When he tells you that a little bit won't hurt you, when he tells you that, oh, just try this, you'll like it. When he says, oh, a little bit won't hurt. A little bit, you know, will do you good. You've got to expand in life. You've got to experience life. You've got to see what life is like before you condemn life. You can't be a good preacher and preach about sin unless you've experienced sin. Well, the average person says, hey, that makes sense to me. Bring on the dancing girls. All right. It just doesn't work like that, though, in reality. He's a liar. He sucks you in, and then he spits you out. John chapter 8. Jesus knows this guy fairly well. And he's got one particular thing to say about him. John chapter 8. Verse 44, John 8, 44. Now here's the, the loving, turn the other cheek, lowly Galilean, just standing there to let everybody walk all over him. Here he is, verse 44. Ye are of your father the devil. He's talking to the Pharisees here. You're of your father the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. He's not pulling any punches here. He's ticked off at somebody. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar. And the father of it. That's Jesus' assessment of this guy. He's a liar. So anything that he tells you, any little, you know little angel or devil sitting on one of your shoulders and saying try this do that go here say this whatever forget it he's a liar the end is never like he portrays it he comes at you subtly <clears throat> second timothy chapter two got a few more attributes that this guy likes to partake in Second Corinthians, or Second Timothy, chapter two. <clears throat> Verse twenty-six. Second Timothy two twenty-six. Paul is talking to Timothy and he says that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will the snare of the devil now we always kind of concentrate on young people on this type of stuff you know because they're the most gullible they're the most uneducated in that sense uh, that they haven't lived life to that extent that they can kind of get these things and see these things but it works for anybody really the stuff that Satan pulls on me right now is not the same stuff that he tried to pull on me when I was 15, 16, 17 years old. There's a monster difference the way he comes at me. He can't tempt me with the same things he did when I was a young guy. Because most of them I can't do anymore. So he just moves on to plan B with me. He never gives up. He never lets you off the hook. He just keeps changing the way he comes at you. He keeps setting a different trap for you. If you want to catch a fish, generally you don't just jump in the water and start thrashing around and trying to catch a fish. Unless you're incredibly lucky, it just won't work. So what do you do? You have to be subtle. You have to set a trap for him. You have to set a snare for him. So you take a hook, you disguise the hook by putting on a piece of something whether it be a worm or an anchovy or something, and you drop it into the water, and then you let him do all the work. You just put the temptation out, and he does all the work. If you want to catch a bird, you don't jump off a building and try to snare one on, on your way down. 
or try to jump up in the air and grab one, you have to fashion a net. And hopefully, after you put that net on a big old pole, you might be able to get a bird. The Bible wants you to understand conceptually that when Satan comes at you, he is not going to confront you just right between the eyes. He's going, just like in the case of Eve, tree was good for food, it was a tree to be desired to make one wise, and that's the way he comes at her, subtly, lays a trap <clears throat> for him. So he's a liar. He'll set snares up for us. He is a tempter. Look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. First Corinthians chapter 7. Verse 5. 1 Corinthians 7, 5, defraud not one another, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not to your incontinency. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about the bedroom here. There are certain times that maybe one or the other partner needs to have a spiritual time with God as such. And that spiritual time, it includes fasting and prayer and going without certain things. So Paul says, you take that time. If the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God come upon you in such that you need to have that spiritual alone time, he says, you take it. But don't take it too far. You do it for a time, and then after that time, then you go back again. Why? Because if you go too long, Satan is going to take one of the, you know, one partner or the other there, and he's going to tempt him or her. Let's read that again with that in context there. Defraud not ye not one the other. And when he says the word defraud, we kind of get a whole different impression. But the old English thing, he's talking about the bedroom here. Oh, I have a headache. Okay, well, the headache will go on for one night, maybe two nights. But you don't go two, three, four weeks, two or three months with that stupid headache. It, it isn't going to work. And if you do, then there are potential problems on the other end. Satan will set a trap for one of them. He will make circumstances come to a convergence. He's going to put temptation in his or her path and things will take place. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent. You guys talk it out before. Oh, I'm going into a spiritual mode here for a few days and I need to fast in prayer and we're not going to come together as such and so just be advised here for a few days. My headache will be gone after that. That ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again. That Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. He's always out to tempt you somehow. He won't come yet at you like a, a Mack truck. First Thessalonians chapter 2. Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 18. First Thessalonians 2.18. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Paul is talking about a missionary journey. He's talking about visiting the church and so forth. He says, once and again, you know, I wanted to come. Wanted to come a lot earlier. Made plans to come. But Satan hindered us. 
He is a very, very active part in your life, and most of the time we don't see it because he is so subtle about it. There's a lot of ways in which he can interact in your life, and you're not even aware it's a spiritual thing. So the Bible wants us to understand we are not ignorant of his devices. You know, that stupid flat tire could have been just a flat tire, or it could have been something else. You walk into that business meeting. You've been into a thousand of them in your life. Some of you go in, you're ambivalent. Some of you go in, you're maybe a little bit nervous. Some of you go in upbeat. Maybe some of you go in and you just had a fight with your spouse and your, your kids are in jail and, and you come in there with a lousy mood and so forth and you can't get out what you need or what they expect you to do in that meeting and you come off looking like a doofus or something. Hey, who's behind that? And we never ascribe something like that in a spiritual way. And yet the spiritual warfare around us is so convoluted and is so pervasive that probably 99% of the stuff that happens to us in life is of a spiritual nature, but we don't recognize it as such. So we don't really get the message. Paul said, all right, Paul said we were hindered. Does that mean that Satan had him by the by his ankles and wouldn't let him go no does that mean that as paul you know walked towards the the stupid plank to get him from the dock onto the ship that satan was standing there with a big club in his hand and says i'm not going to let you get on this ship to go to the next town over there to do what you want to do no but he hindered him nonetheless what maybe paul didn't have enough money to make the voyage uh, maybe he got sick and couldn't make the voyage. Maybe he got distracted by a lot of other problems that didn't allow him the time to be able to drop these and go do what he wanted to do. Who knows? But Satan hindered him. It's the way Satan hinders us. But most of us are not that spiritually perceptive perceptive to understand what is going on behind the scenes and so we don't get drawn closer to God we don't see things in a spiritual light we're not driven to the Bible we're not driven to prayer if we begin to see things around us of a spiritual nature that will drive you to God that will help you to open up this book a little more but because he is so subtle Hey, flat tire, I ran over a nail. That was it. Nothing more than that. There's no big spiritual insight here. There's no big mystery here. I ran over a nail. Well, why didn't the first 500 guys run over that nail? Why did that nail wait for you? Why did you have to have that big fight with your wife or your husband before you went into that business meeting? And now your brain is all scattered and scrambled and so forth, and you come off looking like an idiot in there. Why couldn't the fight have happened after the business meeting? Satan's out to hinder. He doesn't like you. He doesn't like anything about you. Well, this one sounds like a stupid one, but hey, it's biblical. Second Thessalonians. One more and then we'll stop here for today. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's uh, start about verse 8. Second Thessalonians 2, 8. And then shall that wicked, that's with a capital W, so you know he's referring to Satan. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Need a second here. Look at the last part of that again. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan 
with all power and signs and lying wonders? You mean Satan can come with power and signs and lying wonders? Gee, shock. The Bible says that I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. It says I saw Satan transformed into an angel of light. Is it any wonder that the Pharisees kept this monologue going forever? In, it's all the time with Jesus. Show us a sign. Show us a sign. Show us a sign. Somebody's coming is going to show you a sign. You want a sign? Say it's got a sign for you. With all signs and wonders, lying wonders, and power. When Satan gets ready to show himself, 99% of the world, or you know, 90%, whatever it is, of you know, non-Christians to Christians. They're going to think he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. They're going to be so impressed. They're going to be so in awe of the signs and the power and the wonders that he does. They're totally sucked in. So if you get to a point in your prayer life that you are basing your prayer on the fact that God, I, I'm asking for something right here. And I want you to show me a sign. Right there, you're in dangerous ground. We live by faith and not by sight. And so if your natural pro proclivity is in prayer or in your relationship with God, Lord, show me a sign. Uh, show me the fleece like you did with Gideon. Show me something. Send that little hummingbird over to me. Something. Show me a sign. You're on dangerous ground right there. And Jesus got so fed up with these yahoos at one point. He says, look, you want a sign? I'll give you a sign. They weren't going to like it or understand it, really. I'll give you a sign. I'll give you Jonah the prophet. That's it. That's the sign you're going to get. Duh. What does that have to do with anything? They still didn't get it. So if you, in your personal Christian life, have in the past or are currently depending on a sign from God, you know, God, should I do this? Send me a sign. Uh, God, should I do that? Send me a sign. Forget it. Just back right off. Get down on your knees and ask him to forgive you of your sin. Forget the signs. God will work it out. It's Satan who's all caught up in the signs and power and lying wonders. That's how he gets through. That's how he makes his point. God says the just shall live by faith and not by sight. So you either trust God or you don't. Simple as that. All right. We've determined basically Satan's no good. He's a liar. He's a cheat. He's a usurper. He wants to be something that he's not. Jesus doesn't like him. God doesn't like him. We shouldn't like him. He does not come at you like a Mack truck. He's going to come subtly. He's going to set traps. He's going to set snares. He's going to tempt you. He's not going to take a baseball bat and come and hit you over the head with it. He's going to tempt you. He is subtle. One thing you can say about him, he is subtle. Next week, we'll go on to some other aspects of this. Father, I thank you that with an enemy such as this, that you have given us so much information, that you have opened up the book and peeled back the layers of what he really is. But Father, more than anything else, I am thankful and happy for the fact that he that is in me is greater than he that is within the world. That he may buffet me, he may hinder me, 
He may knock me down. He may, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Uh, I don't really care. He that is within me is greater than he that is within the world. I am sealed unto the day of redemption. I don't have to worry about him. He cannot get my soul. He cannot take me to hell. He cannot do anything in that nature. I thank you. But Father, at the same time, help us not to forget that he can hinder us. He can thwart us. He can tempt us. He can nullify our effectiveness as Christians. So this isn't anything to be taken lightly or to just assume that it's a foregone conclusion. We're saved and okay. Uh, we're, we're great. No, he still messes with us. He still wants to nullify us and take us out of the game. Father, help us to understand him for what he really is. Help us to understand life as to what it really is. Help us to understand things that are going on for what they really are. It is a spiritual warfare. Help us to get it, Lord. In Jesus' name. Living, forgiven. 